Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first eight verses in chapter one. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. God, open our hearts and minds this day. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be with you this day, now and always. Amen. From his book, Gentle Thunder, Max Locato has this to say about God. There are many reasons God saves you to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he is fond of you. He, he likes having you around. He thinks that you are the best thing to come down the pike in a really long time. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he will listen. God can choose to live anywhere in the universe, and he chose your heart. And the Christmas gift he sent to Bethlehem, face it, friend, he's just crazy about you. I think Max Lucado is saying something very important. Here we are preparing our hearts for the birth of of Jesus. We are getting our houses and our families ready for that baby in the manger born on Christmas Day. And as much as we celebrate the birth, it is God who is crazy about us. On Christmas Day, we celebrate Jesus' birthday, but God gives us all of the presents. God gives us a planet and a place to call our own. God gives us talents and abilities so that we can not only live, but we can thrive in this world. We have a conscience and a Holy Spirit to guide and direct us on this journey. God gives us the ability to love one another, to forgive one another, and to care for one another. God gives us the freedom to choose. We get to choose how we will live, how we will serve, how we will thank or not thank God for all that he has given. And best of all, God gives us the gift of his son. In Christ, we get to see God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. In Christ, we have that living presence so that we are never alone. And we have that presence of one who has been there and who has gone through what we're going through. And therefore, we have someone who holds our hand every step along our journey. As Christians, we have the privilege as we prepare for Christmas to celebrate all the wonders that God has given us. Now, in the Bible, we learn of a man whose sole purpose was to prepare the way for the coming of Christ into the world. His name was John, and his character and strength is something that we need to look at today. John appeared on the scene announcing a baptism of repentance. This proved to be a very effective ministry because people by the thousands flocked to be baptized. John was calling, John was calling to preach and prepare people for the coming of Jesus. He was a master at preparing for Jesus and praising all whom he was. And that's because John had unique 
qualities. Qualities that we can strive for that will help us on our journey of faith. So in wonderful Presbyterian fashion, we're going to look at the qualities of John. And of course, because we're Presbyterian, there are three qualities, right? There's always three things that we talk about. So there are three qualities to look at. The first quality is this was a man who devoted his life to God. He did not have other needs or interests that got in the way of his relationship with God. He lived a life of simplicity. He did not have expensive tastes or masses of wealth or materialistic needs. He lived in the desert in solitude. He wore a garment woven of camel's hair and a leather belt round his waist. He was simply dressed and did not give in to the comforts of the world. He ate locusts and honey. We can gather from this that this diet was probably simple. Uh, he probably ate food that was needed for nourishment, but not anything that would have been used as the secret ingredient in Iron Chef Jerusalem. <laughs> John's devotion was to God. He didn't need to live near people or wear fancy clothes or eat for pleasure. His simple life afforded him the time to devote that life to serving his God. The second quality we learn from John is his ability to speak to a person's heart. John's message was one of calling people to repentance. He told people to turn from their ways, to live as God intended, and to prepare for God's chosen that would come to be with them. John had the ability to reach into a person's conscience. When he called people to repent, he was asking them to take a deep breath, to look at themselves, and to do what they knew in their heart of hearts to be the right thing. It takes a special individual to be able to stir at a person's emotions. And John was indeed a special man of God. And the third quality is John was humble. He certainly didn't look or dress the part of someone who was trying to be noticed. His whole message of repentance was to prepare the way for one who was greater than himself. If his job was to bring people to God, he more than succeeded, and yet John didn't make it about John. He said, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to tie his sandal. It must have been difficult for someone who was baptizing thousands of people, someone who had disciples, someone who commanded a great following, someone who was at the height of their ministry, it must have been difficult to give all the credit and all the glory for that success to another. John knew better than anyone that his purpose in life was not about success or prestige or power. His purpose was to prepare others and to give all the credit to God. John was a unique servant and one that we learn from. So how are we going to do that? How do we take the qualities of John the Baptist that devotion to God, the ability to speak to one's heart, and, and the ability to be humble, how do we take those qualities and apply them to our lives? How do those qualities help us in preparing for Christmas? How do they help us in living with God every single day? Well, again, in true Presbyterian fashion, we have to take them. There we go. We have to take them. <laughs> We have to take them one at a time. We have to look at them and apply them to our, to, and apply those qualities to our life. So the first is devotion to God. Now, we don't have to be like John. I don't believe God is asking us to live in solitude, to eat and dress comfortably, and to live that life of isolation. But it doesn't mean that we can't be devoted to God. So how do we devote ourselves to God? It's the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. There's no big secret to devote ourselves to God. We must do it and stick with it each and every day of our lives until it becomes ingrained in us, until it is that muscle memory that works in us, until it becomes second nature. So to be devoted to God, keep doing the things that we're supposed to do for God. Read those Bible stories, read that scripture every single day, even if it's for the 50th time, because reading scripture gives us a connection to God. 
pray and pray every day, even if you fall asleep at night, in the middle of your prayers, keep it going because praying is how we have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And do what Jesus would do, even when we don't want to, even when it's the hardest thing to do, because living as Jesus lived gives us our best advantage on who God wants us to be. There is no secret if we want to devote ourselves to God, we devote ourselves to it. We put the time into our relationship with God. But if we follow John, we're also supposed to be able to speak to one's heart. And that one's a little difficult. That one's a little different. I had trouble with that one when, because it's easy for me to see what John was doing speaking to one's heart because he had that ability to look right into the conscience and call them in God's name to repent. I'm not going to do that to people. I'm not going to run up and say, repent, you sinner. I, it's not really my style. But, but I still can have that heart. I still can seek into the heart of God. And I do that by helping one another, by caring for another, by accepting someone for who they are. Not who I would want them to be, not who I think they should be, but who they are as a person and as a child of God. That's important when we meet someone who are, for where they are. It's also important that we, we listen. A lot of times when we help someone, I don't think we mean to, but I think we sometimes like to hear ourselves talk. And I think it's important to listen to what someone has to say. Sitting and listening can be the greatest way to help someone, because sometimes they just need to talk. And sometimes we just need to listen. And the Greek philosopher Epictetus gets credit for that famous phrase that says, God gave us two ears and one mouth. So we should listen twice as much as we should talk. And sometimes that helps to know a person's heart by simply listening to them. Sometimes we have to know what to say and when to say it and when not to say something. Because that's important when we, where we meet people as they live. My friend Patty has a, a litmus test that she goes through every time she decides whether or not to say something to somebody. And the test goes like this. She asks herself three things. Is what I'm about to say, is it true? Is it loving? Is it necessary? If she can't put it into those three categories, she doesn't say it. Speaking to one's heart is knowing how to be their form. It's knowing how to listen. And sometimes it's knowing what not to say. The third thing John tells us is he tells us that he, he shows us a life of being humble. This one is hard for all of us, even if you think it's not. We're not very good at being humble. We like to be thanked. We like to be given credit. We like to be appreciated for the things we do. We want people to know what we're doing. We want people to know that we care. It's important. And there's nothing absolutely, there isn't anything wrong with that. But to have a humble life before God, we have to be careful of that wanting the credit or anything. Women do this much better than men. Women are much better at being humble than men are. I'm creating a turf war here between the boys <laughs> and the girls. But, but I think it's true. And, and I can only relate it to my, to my own life and my own marriage with, with Marcy. We, we both, I, I feel, although she does a lot better than I do, but I feel we do things in the house about 50-50. We both do chores. Some chores are mine, some chores are her. Some chores it's whoever gets there first. And we, and we both raise the kids and take them to the things and so on and so forth. But she just does it so much more. And you'd never know. It's just getting done. She doesn't tell you. She just does it. She gets up early to take care of the dog in the morning, which I'm really missing, by the way, <laughs> because, because I don't have to do that. Um, she's, she's, a, she's a friend to her mother, she takes care of the kids, she, uh, you know, I'm used to working between 50 and 78 hours a week, depending on the week, and I need a nap just listening to what this woman does in a day, and, and it's all, it all goes unspoken, unsaid, she just does it. Now me, and I hope, like most men, I can't do anything without being noticed, whether it's spending hours on the lawn, 
cleaning out the fridge, defrosting the freezer, or putting a knife in the dishwasher. I have to bring Marcy over and show her what I did. <laughs> so look at the lawn, I spent hours on it. And so she can say, oh, you're wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that most boys are like that, and I know most girls are not. But, but we like the credit. We like to know that we're needed. We like to know that we're wanted. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if we follow John's example, we must be humble and humble in heart, which means we need to understand that it's God that gets the credit. It's God that gets the glory. God gives us everything, creates us, gives us here to give us choices and responsibilities to live and love for him. And all he asks in return is that we give and do for God. And that's the, that's the key here. We do for God so that God can get the credit. There's nothing greater than, than, than bringing someone to church, bringing someone to God, and giving God all the credit so God can do for them in their lives what God does for us in our lives. And the way we do that is to be humble. The way we do that is to speak into someone's heart. And the way we do that is to be devoted for God. It's not, look what I can do, look at all that I can do. That's not the attitude we should have. The attitude should be, look at all what God can do through me. Let us pray. Precious God, be with us this day. Help us to see the qualities in John that bring out your goodness and your love. And help us to live out those qualities each and every day. Amen.